namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one Ammo sadanto sucedoye alahudi sammyao sampato shi. Ammo sadanto sucedoye alahudi sammyao sampato shi. Ushang shen shen wei miao fa, bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. Wo jin jian wan de shou shi, yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Goei Shishong, Dharma Master, Venerable Masters, Dharma Friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. Today, here in Australia, it is Sunday, May 29th, and it's Saturday, May 28th, uh, back in California. Glad that you're with us. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. That's not part of the lecture, by the way. There we go. Um, we're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra today. I'm going to conclude chapter 19 and get launched, get started into chapter 20. Uh, we have two more things to do before we actually begin the lecture, which is to invoke spiritual presence to invite the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions and the Three Periods of Time and the Avatamsaka Assembly to come to our lecture and uh, bless everyone with their light. And we do that with a melody. of country, say the Komomeri people of the Ugambe language group practice spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and to all creation here in this location for tens of thousands of years. Today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land, and we acknowledge them with gratitude as we share this land today with sorrow for the cost of that sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge as well all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, it was gratifying to see uh, the new Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Anthony Albanese, uh, when he gave his acknowledgement speech, his victory speech, first thing he did was acknowledge country. Sure enough, that's really the way it's done here in Australia. So. Um, we're going to reintroduce that custom when we get back to California. Today, we are concluding our 
lecture series on chapter 19 of the Flower Garland Sutra. It's called Sheng Ye Mo Tian Gong Pin Di Shi Jiu, Ascending to a Palace in the Suyama Heaven. And it's one of the shorter chapters, and it's interesting because it's spoken originally by a deva, by a god, is who was qualified to, uh, to the, the Buddha gave him the job of explaining that part of the sutra. So uh, we're going to preview the chapter 20, which follows right after it. So that's what we have in mind today. So let's get started. We're going to do, let's see here. We'll split this, these two paragraphs in two. So here's the first one. Here we go. Ru zi shi jie zhong ye mo tian wang cheng fu shen li yi nian wang xi zhu fu gong de cheng yang zan tan shi fang shi jie ye mo tian wang xi yi ru shi tan fu gong de. And just as in this world, the Suyama Heaven Celestial King received the Buddha's awesome strength and, after recalling past Buddha's merit and virtue, sang hymns in their praise, comma, so did Celestial Kings of the Suyama Heavens in each world of Ten Directions. They all praised the Buddha's merit and virtue. I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, you are not sharing. I'm not uh, sharing. I should be sharing. There we go. Thank you for letting me know. There it is. Now, since uh, Jerry, our tireless uh, engineer that makes this webcast happen week after week, brought to my attention that you all only heard me, you didn't see the text. Um, what I'm going to do is I have a second version of this text. Uh, which I think is an improvement. And I, this is kind of, uh, uh, what do they say, showing your dirty laundry? Uh, there, there are many Chinese idioms for that. Uh, it's like, uh, you could say just your dao guo. So acknowledging that what? This translation is a work in progress. Uh, it can be improved on. So as I, when I sent my second draft that had been also corrected to our volunteer text coordinator who does the layout. Um, I read it when it came back and it was like, ooh, I wish I could change it. And so uh, we will in a future version, but what I did was redo it myself for you all. And let's take a look at version number four. This is number four and it's going to be improved in the future again. Since now we're, I've got you on the screen, here's, here's the new one. Ready, let's try again. And just as the Suyama Heaven's celestial king in this world received the Buddha's spiritual strength and after recalling past Buddha's merit and virtue sang the hymns and praise, comma, so too did celestial kings of the Suyama Heavens in each world of ten directions raise their songs. They all praise the Buddha's merit and virtue. Okay, now, there we are. There's a phenomenon happening here that is uh, uh, typical for the Avatamsaka state, the Huayan Jingjie, which is in Chinese they call it Chong Chong Wu Jin, and they also call it uh, Yuan Yong Wu Ai. So Chong Chong Wu Jin means repeated, repeated, endlessly repeated over and over, just once and around and around. These things happen. Um, and furthermore, so there's a succession. You think it's another way to translate that is layer upon layer without end. So chong can be to repeat. It can also mean uh, multiplicity like in layers, like a, think of a layer cake. Uh, so the, uh, what's going on here is the, uh, let's see, before I 
interpret, let me give you the second line, Yuan Yong Wu Ai. Yuan Yong Wu Ai is a state, they call it interpenetrating, without any obstruction. So things of, multi of 3D can actually incorporate and re disincorporate and then reincorporate united. They merge. Kind of, uh, if you think about pouring, uh, what would it be, a spoonful of sugar into your coffee, it just melts and the coffee becomes sweeter. Uh, there's no, the coffee doesn't have to move for the sugar. It just merges. They meld. They uh, melt into each other. So, Yan Yong Wu Ai is like that. Now, when you put the two of those together, Chung Chung Wu Jin, which is repeating in succession, but also repeating in dimension, plus the idea of merging entirely, re embodying, changing your body, and come, becoming incorporating. You think a corpse as corp, corporeal, like a body. You reincorporate without obstructing each other, but it's a new thing is created. That's what's going on here. And it's an avatamsaka state that happens throughout the sutra, uh, along with multiple other marvelous uh, feats of, of material change that physics is catching up to. Now, okay. What did it say? It said, the king of the Suyama heaven welcomes the Buddha to his palace. We've been following this chapter. That's what's, what's going on. People will recall that uh, the Buddha announced that he was going to, that he had some Avatamsaka Dharma to speak. And he traveled up to the Suyama heaven, Yemotian, and he, uh, the the deva in charge of the Suyama heaven saw the Buddha coming and prepared and built a place for the Buddha to sit. Can you see the Buddha behind me right there in the altar, sitting in full lotus on, an, on a lotus? So our king, the king of the gods there in the Suyama heaven, said, I'm going to get ready. And so being a deva, he was an expert already in uh, decorating in adorning that's the devas have these blessings and they have the best lights the best flowers the best music the best incense the best garments and they make use of all those things to welcome the Buddha or to celebrate some sort of an event so that's what's happened and the sutra described ooh, this wonderful seat this throne this uh, place for the Buddha to sit and the Buddha started, you know, started up to he was going to arrive, and the he came. The Deva King said, "Please accept our invitation to to this wonderful palace." And the Buddha uh, indicated that he would, and then the Deva King did something unusual, did something unexpected. He launched into a series of praises talking about how our Buddha, who was about to speak, was not the first. That the Deva, in fact, had welcomed, had been there for the arrival of 10 different Buddhas. He named them and he sang, he, he uh, eulogized, is that the word? He put his feelings into music and he sang. He said, this is wonderful, the Buddha has come. Other Buddhas have been here and made this place very auspicious. That was the word that appeared over and over again. Shi gu zi chu zui ji shang. He said, that's why this place is the most auspicious. This is a lucky place. This place has good chi. The Japanese would say, kimochi ga yi This has got really good kimochi. This is good chi fun here. And the Buddha coming to speak Dharma, you can't have a more... Uh, salubrious, a more a happier event worthy of celebration. Oh my goodness, here's the Buddha, wow. Bringing that light, bringing all of, you know, the Buddha doesn't travel alone. When the Buddha speaks Dharma, 
there's gods and dragons and eightfold pantheon and disciples and kings from the, from the worlds and anybody and bodhisattvas by the legion, anyone who can wants to come to hear the Buddha speak Dharma. So it's quite an event and that the Deva King is happy. So that's what brought us to where we are today. And this, the sutra is at pains to say, as all these events happened in the Suyama heaven before us, in worlds in 10 directions, the very same thing happened. Okay, explain that. Mm. I believe it is the case. My eyes don't see it. The sutra says so. The Buddha tells us it happened and there's no benefit in doubting the Buddha. There's no reason to. Um, skeptics might go, oh yeah? How could this event be replicated in worlds in the very same way? What is the mechanism causing that to happen? Show me the links of causality that have this event replicated in 10 directions. And we're asking, how does Abhatamsaka states happen? How does that work? Um, even in other Buddhist communities, they would say, our sutras don't talk about this. How is this possible? Okay, so my point of bringing this up is I think prior to post-Newtonian physics, prior to post-Einsteinian physics, uh, there was the rise of quantum physics and the idea of quantum mechanics. And I am not qualified to uh, talk about it. I've, I've only read a bit. I, I am not trained in laboratory science. But I do know that when people who are, people who are investigating the fringes, the, the farthest reaches of contemporary physics thought, try to explain why does it do that? Why does, when we look at events in physics, we look in things like we have something called bubble chambers. And there's an event happens here, and to explain why an event happens over there, we need new theories. And when they read the Avatamsaka Sutra, they say, this looks like what we're seeing through our most advanced measuring devices. Our best guess is, is that thing indeed, an event here can cause something happening very far away. So it gives rise to uh, contemporary memes like they say, if a butterfly flaps his wings in the northern hemisphere, could that small action of a butterfly doing this rapidly cause a hurricane on the other side I of get that. A, a hurricane on the other side of the planet? Could that happen? And uh, there are theories that say we think so. We think there's a connection. So just to say that the reason why the Avatamsaka Sutra has not been acclaimed by more and more laboratory scientists as having some very interesting descriptions of what's going on in the physical world, the only reason why not is because it hasn't been translated and circulated and put in the hands of men and women who are using the advanced tools of measurement that science provides to say, we're watching this happen. This is actually, you know, the Buddha using his laboratory of his now awakened body, mind, and nature describe these events that we see happening right in front of us. So interesting, huh? So yeah, it's, it's, there's much more here. Let's, now, having said that, should we try one more time applying that notion to, um, as, as in, you know, uh, my job here is to read it and to draw some connections, illustrate it if I can, explain challenges in the, in the, in the words and maybe make a connection in the real world. But when I have something like this, talking about an event here is replicated there, 
It's like, where do you go? How do you explain that? One thing, and I think traditionally you say, the Buddha says. Um, but what if, what if you have the tools of science to explain? Wouldn't that be lovely? Okay, one more time. Let's take a look here. So it says, 如此, 世界中, 夜末, 天王, just like this, in our world, the Suyama Heaven King, Cheng Fo Shen Li took the Buddha's spiritual strength, Yi Nian Wang Shi Zhu Fo Gong De, and remembered the merit and virtue of all the Buddhas in the past, and then Cheng Yang Zan Tan praised them, comma, Shi Fang Shi Jie Ye Mo Tian Wang Shi Yi Ru Shi Zan Fo Gong De. In Suyama Heavens and Worlds of the Ten Directions, the kings all did the very same thing, praising the Buddha's merit and virtue. Okay? There you go. Yeah, that's very compelling. That's very interesting. It, could it be that that's just factual description? That's exactly what happened. And if my vision were tuned, if I had spiritual vision that allowed me to see that, it would, it would be happening in front of my eyes. Yeah, this is the Avatamsaka state. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied simply by saying, it's in the sutra, it must be true. That's kind of like a, lit, a literal Bible interpretation. Every word comes from God's golden mouth. I believe it is true, right? Well, you can listen uncritically, that's good. Uh, there's another way that is not critical, but suspends judgment. I'm not going to say true, false, until I learn more. Clearly, the Buddha knows more than I do about what's going on, and he can use different levels of vision to describe it, but uh, that's not to say that I can't. It's just that it inspires me to want to dig deeper, to look deeper. And how interesting that this idea of event being replicated across a distance without a, an apparent mechanism between them. That's the idea of quantum. You can't say, oh, this happened. The wind blew and the leaves moved. The wind blew the leaves. You can't, in, with the quantum descriptions of, of how things really work, it's not one-to-one -one mechanical. There's no lever by which you pull and the, you know, the rock rolls down the hill. There, in between, there's this gap. So how does that action be caused by this cause? So here's the Buddha saying, yep, there is a, there's a relationship. Here in the Suyama heaven, with the Buddha's speaking Dharma, every world, there are multiple worlds, he says, every Suyama heaven there has the same thing going on. That's interesting. That's really, really compelling. Especially when physics says, oh, we've got theories that talk about that, yes. <laughs> and we can measure it. So, yeah. Now, there, I want to say one more thing before we leave this topic. It is not the case that until science proves it, it's true. How long have, has science, what do they say? Now it's like 70% of all the scientists who've ever lived are still alive. Science is a very young discipline. And the idea of measuring things in the material world based on what? How fast do they move? What do they weigh? What is their uh, atomic makeup? How many atoms of hydrogen? How many atoms of oxygen, etc.? This way of approaching uh, the questions, what is it? Or why does it do that? Uh, the Chinese scientific inquiry was Ti Xiang Yong. What is it made of? What does it look like? What does it do? Science asks those questions. And they've only been able to do so for a brief time of human history. The Buddha's sutras have been in the world and available for 2,500 years minimum. And they're, uh, and we haven't had them in Chinese and English or Vietnamese, or Japanese, or Korean, or Tibetan, or Sanskrit, Pali. But the, the idea that the Buddha didn't wait for science for the things that he described about the physical world, about the material world. Um, 
So, what's exciting to me about that is that Buddhism can be science friendly. That when you come to the Dharma and look at the sutras in particular, that aspect of the Buddha's teaching is the words he left behind. Uh, science, the scientists whose minds are not locked into one paradigm or bound by Newton and, and Einstein can say, this is very compelling. And the, the most uh, open-minded of those laboratory physicists in particular are investigating other disciplines such as yoga and meditation and the Buddhist descriptions of, of the world as a way to uh, deepen their understanding of what's really going on. What's going on in the physical world? Why does it do that? Golly, Mr. Science, right? So, yeah, very cool. Next paragraph, ready? One more, here we go. And the last one of the, of the chapter, oops, not that one. Here we are, here it is. Er shi shi zun ru mo ni zhuang yan dian yu bao lian hua zhang shi zi zuo shang jie jia fu zuo zi dian hu ran guang bo kuan rong ru qi tian zhong zhu suo zhu chu shi fang shi jie xi yi ru shi Then the world honored one entered the mani adorned palace and upon the flower treasury lion's throne, sat with his legs in full lotus posture. Suddenly the palace expanded vastly wider and deeper. And just as this happened in the abodes of the multitudes of devas, so too did it happen just the same in deva palaces in worlds of the 10 directions. Let's look at the other version. Here it is right here, this is the one. See if this is an improvement. Then the world honored one entered the Mani adorned palace and sat with his legs in full lotus posture upon the flower treasury lion's throne. Suddenly the palace expanded in vast measure, going wider and deeper. Just the way this happened in the abodes of the multitudes of devas, so too did it happen identically in deva palaces throughout worlds of the ten directions. Okay, there we go. Now let's take a look what happened. First thing, make that a little bigger there, was the Buddha arrived. He said yes. He came in and he did what Dharma speakers have done since the Buddha's time, which is sit on the throne and cross the legs. The sutra specifies that the Buddha sits in full lotus. Isn't that interesting? I can actually, there we go. The Buddha sat in full lotus. That was, that was, it's, the sutra says so. Jie jia fu zuo. Sat down upon the, uh, it, first of all, it mentions how beautiful the palace is, and then the throne that the deva, the, the Suyama heaven king, uh, prepared. And more magic. This is hard to explain. What happened was, the palace boom, just grew. Um, every time the Buddha speaks a portion of the Avatamsaka Sutra, the same thing happens. Uh, the, uh, the palace boom, changes size wherever the Buddha goes to speak to include all the beings who are about to arrive. So, and then it says, here's the repeat. As it was here, so too did it happen in other worlds in the north, the south, the east, the west, the intermediate directions above and below. Same way. So this, this uh, chong chong wu jin replicating infinitely and interpenetrating without any obstacles. Same thing happened. Okay, there we go. Now, what's fascinating to me about that is how the sutra uh, wants us to know that the Buddha sat in full lotus. Um, 
the Buddha behind me, if you can see, sitting in full lotus. The two bodhisattvas on either side are also sitting in full lotus. Why would it talk about that? I'm going to bring up my browser. Can you all see this Buddha sitting in full lotus? Here's a really clear one. This is actually Dharma Realm Buddhist University. Oh, posted this one. Here we go. Okay, Buddha's in full lotus. Here is a Thai tradition Buddha, the Bangkok tourism. In interesting, here's a Thai Buddha sitting in full lotus. Huh. Typically, a Thai Buddhist statue will be sitting in half lotus. Oh, am I not sharing? Did I not do it again? She was. Sorry about that. That's why we pay Jerry the big bucks. Okay, here we go. This is the Dharma Realm Buddhist University statue. How about that? It's so uh, clearly that there's something about this posture. Something is significant about sitting this way. And can I point out something? Look at the hands. In each of these images, look at the hands. That one, that one. This one is a different mudra. Okay, hands are in the lap, aren't they? One on top of the other. Left below, right above, thumbs touching. That is a standard full lotus posture. Here's a Thai Buddha, same. Hands not on the knees with the fingers outstretched the way uh, the New York Times would show us when they're, they periodically give instructions on meditation these days, in the days of quarantine and, and isolation. Um, they show us meditating with the hands on the knees and yet Buddha images show us a different posture. Look at that. Okay. Let's see here. Full lotus. Look at the feet. This is the, the Buddha touching the earth mudra, asking the earth to verify that his awakening. Okay. Moving on here. Same. Same. There we go. There's a Buddha in full lotus. Like that. Let's, uh, let's borrow this one. We'll take that down. Okay. So, there we go. What are we talking about? Take a look here. This is called lotus posture. Uh, some people call it double lotus. Shuang jia fu zuo. Here is, and what is going on? The left foot is on the top of the right thigh, and the right foot is on the top of the left thigh. The posture is straight, eyes are looking down. Half lotus, one leg is tucked under, but not on top of the left thigh. The left leg is on top of the right thigh. This is half lotus. Burmese style, according to our illustration here, has both feet flat. No, the foot has not been pulled up to the top of the thigh. There is another Japanese Zazen posture where, I think it's called Seiza, where the legs are curled underneath and there's a Zafu, a sitting cushion, uh, underneath the meditator's butt, on, underneath the rear end. So the two legs are bent at the knee and going back. You're sitting on the top of your shins this way with the zafu in between. 
Oh, so this is called sezat. This is with a bench. This is with a zafu. This is with a bench. Your legs are tucked under a bench and touching the ground here. Then there's chair sitting. Okay? What are these? These are illustrations uh, that are necessary for new meditators. Many people now want to know about meditation. And so they are investigating how do you sit when you want to sit still for a long time and contemplate the movement of the mind. These are the choices, and this is pretty standard. There's also standing meditation, there's walking meditation, but we're talking about seated meditation, right? Full lotus or lotus posture, half lotus, Burmese with legs in front, two kinds of Japanese Zen sitting with the legs tucked under, one with a cushion under, one with a bench, and then sitting on a chair. Interesting, interesting. Here's a Buddha here at the Gold Coast Dharma Realm sitting in full lotus. That's interesting. Hmm. Okay. So we're investigating the sutra here because it described the Buddha accepting the invitation of the Suyama Heaven King coming in and taking a seat on the throne that was prepared for him and crossing his legs in full lotus. Hmm. Interesting. So, question arises, is the ability to sit in full lotus absolutely essential if you're a Buddha, or if you want to become a Buddha? Um, my answer to that question is, depends who you listen to. It depends. Uh, to say it is essential and necessary, um, Master Hua, traditional teacher from the Chinese Chan school would say, cross your legs. He didn't, he didn't wiggle on that requirement. When you did a Chan session with Master Hua, he would say, here's what you do. Put your legs in full lotus. Be patient, he would say. And I, I, as soon as I try to imitate his voice, it comes out sounding sounding hard. I guess that's my gut reaction to, uh, to doing a chan at Gold Mountain Monastery or City of 10,000 Buddhas. And it was there, the, this uh, instruction to sit in full lotus came with the acknowledgement that there was a bit of discomfort involved in sitting in full lotus. It, after a while, your legs can feel, they can go to sleep, they can feel pain, you can feel pain in, the, the, in your sacral area of your spine. Um, if you hang on to your full lotus through the pain, um, there can be a transformation. Something called the pain gate can open and the pain suddenly shifts because what hurts? Why should meditation be painful? That's the question that many, many, many new meditators ask. And Master Hua would explain, he would say, you know how it happens when you're watering your flowers with a garden hose and you tug on the hose and the hose kinks like that and the water stops flowing. And if you don't undo the kink, the hose at, at some point can burst, but in any case, the water is not flowing through and you're not gonna succeed in watering your flowers. He said, when you sit in full lotus, you are kinking your blood and your chi. So the blood comes along in the blood vessels, the arteries and the veins, and when you cross your legs, most people need to be patient while the pressure coming along the legs 
works its way through. But he said there are other channels that need to be communicated, that need to tone, need to connect. One is your chi. And the chi is this miraculous force that Western medicine grudgingly accepted. Uh, the chi is, runs in what are called meridians. This is the stuff of acupuncture. And acupuncture is not limited to the Chinese. There's an, indeed Ayurveda, Indian traditional medicine, uh, as old as Chinese medicine, uh, absolutely verifies the existence of qi and measures it with pulse diagnosis, taking a pulse, the various pulses here in the wrist. And there's numerous pulses. And a good trained Chinese or Indian physician reads the qi up through their fingertips, sensitized to what's going on here, and tells you the state of your, your physical health. Um, when you cross your legs in full lotus, the energy of that qi also needs to tong, needs to, to connect, to break, to penetrate. And when it does, when that knot in the hose is unknotted, is released, there is a feeling of genuine well-being and unity and harmony and full strength and renewal and ease in the body that comes with this reconnection of the body's internal circuitry. There's also nerves, and the nerves sometimes can take a while to connect. So, Master Hua would explain it this way, and he would say, if you do not, if you never put your legs in full lotus, you are never going to tong, you're never going to, to connect the body's internal circuits. You will never know that feeling of well-being and harmony and unity uh, that you can feel when you reach what is called the dhyanas, chan ding, dhyana samadhi, the state of well-being that is a result of sitting in full lotus. So, Sherpa would say, okay, cross them, cross your legs. He said, be patient. You got to be patient. Ren, ren, so banang ren. Wrong, ren, so banang wrong. Be patient or other people can't be patient. You have to go with, allow, let happen things that other people can't let happen. You have to xing ren so banang xing. You have to practice what people cannot practice. You have to, uh, to in just be, be uh, one with things that other people run away from. So that kind of difficulty, he said, is part of meditation. Expect it, understand it, don't be afraid of it, allow it to happen, and you too will make it through the pain gate to this place where you're experiencing something that you can't experience otherwise. All right, so that was the theory. Did everybody do it? No, we, not everybody could. And, and I remember uh, <laughs> one of my early experiences teaching meditation at the Berkeley Monastery to a, to a crowd of newcomers. And I was not very experienced and I, I was trained by Master Hua to sit in full lotus. And so I said, okay, we're gonna teach everybody to sit in full lotus. <laughs> and this, this uh, Swedish, woman came from down from UC Berkeley and she said excuse me she says uh, I have a European body our bodies don't bend like that and no we don't uh, Westerners can't no we, we it's not gonna bend like that teach me something else she said I'm like, oh really okay so um, the uh, I beg to differ I grew up in Ohio I have a you know holy Toledo I have a Irish Scottish body and I I found myself strangely sitting in full lotus at age 14. And the influence was uh, a book called Lives of the Bengal Lancers. And Lives of the Bengal Lancers was written by, I forgot the author's name. Uh, I found another copy of it not long ago, but I, what was his name? Uh, he described, he was sent to India as part of the Raj and the occupying colonial forces. And he didn't want to fight he was fascinated by the mystical, spiritual cultivation side of India, as many, many, many generations of people have been. 
And what he, uh, he investigated these uh, uh, yogis. And I remember the, the, the story that he told that stayed with me was, he said, this yogi has such through meditation because he can sit with his body in full lotus. This yogi controls his body. He can tell you things that seem to be unavailable to ordinary folks, and he can perform miracles that other people cannot manage. <laughs> what was the one that stayed in my mind was he said he witnessed a yogi somewhere in Calcutta. The yogi took four cloths. They were silk, very fine cloths. One was green, one was red, one was yellow, one was blue, and he wadded them up, swallowed them down. And they're like, oh, swallowing silk cloths? And he said, and then, marvel, marvelous to be told, the yogi could bring them back up in any order you asked, the blue one first or the red one or the yellow one or the green one. He had complete, he knew where they went in his stomach and he could bring them back up. And you're going, who wants to do that? So how cool. You know, <laughs> my 14-year-old self was like, ooh, that's, that's neat. So yeah, so wonderful strength, wonderful feats of strength. So, okay, now the idea, why was I able to sit in full lotus as a kid? I was flexible, but I was a baseball player, I was a basketball player, I was a football player, I was a tennis player. I didn't have any particular connection with, with uh, yoga. But because I read this book, I thought, can I do that? Yeah. So I pull one leg up, pull the other leg up. It's like, wow, that was, there wasn't any pain involved. And I didn't, you know, I'd like to say that I entered samadhi, but I didn't. No, it was just like, oh, that's kind of weird. Okay. But I knew that I couldn't explain that to my, my baseball buddies. They wouldn't have accepted that. That would have been, what are you, what? You what? The, you know, that wouldn't have gone down. Only later, when I got to, it was 14, another five years, when uh, I went to college for the first day walked into my college dormitory and opened the door and there was my roommate who I had not met yet sitting in full lotus meditating it was like oh and seeing a person doing what the Buddha if you can I'll slide aside here you can see the Buddha when I looked into my room there was my roommate sitting like that. He didn't have, this is Vairochana's mudra. He didn't have Vairochana's. He, his hands were like this, the way uh, meditation, uh, the, the meditation posture. But something about seeing a human body knit together energetically like that just captivated me. It was like, dong, I recognized it. And it, not just with my eyes and my mind. It was like, I felt that, mm, that connection that my roommate, David Bernstein, was, was doing. And I closed the door. I didn't want to bother him. And he opened it. Oh, come on in, come on in. You know, that's no worry. No worry. He hopped out of full lotus. And, and he was doing, I've told this story before, his brother, David Bernstein's brother, had discovered the um, uh, Korean style of, uh, who was the Sunim? who started the Providence Zen Center. And uh, so he had had an exposure to Korean Zen sitting. And younger brother, my roommate, had followed the older brother and learned how to do it. So from that day on, uh, David Bernstein and I would meditate together in our rooms and you know, make it part of our daily practices. And then along with uh, brown rice, and the brown rice diet and uh, everything we could, we could discover about living the Zen life. We hadn't heard of Chan, but we knew about Zen. So, okay, that was my first encounter with Full Lotus. But here's the woman in the Buddha Hall at Berkeley Monastery saying, no, 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 we, I'm a European, we don't sit like that. What else have you got for me? <laughs> and okay, so, she was convinced that her legs wouldn't bend, it wouldn't allow her to meditate, but she wanted to meditate. So, here's the thing. Um, every Thursday night, 
from the first year of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery to the present, to the time of, of COVID quarantine, every Thursday night, the Spirit Rock East Bay meditation group, which then became the East Bay uh, uh, Mindfulness, East Bay Meditation Community, um, a, who were studying from the tradition taught by Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein, which is a form of Vipassana meditation uh, coming down through the Thai tradition. Um, they took the Buddha Hall of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery every Thursday night for 20 plus years. Uh, part of our family, part of our larger family. That group almost always numbered over between 70 to 90 people on a given Thursday. And it was almost entirely Westerners, uh, African Americans included, Hispanic Americans, a few Asians, but mostly Caucasians, many Jewish psychotherapists, interestingly. And half of the group would sit in a chair. Half of the group chose to sit on the floor. And exactly as we saw in our illustration here, with uh, some people sat in full lotus, a few, many sat in half lotus, uh, a few were trained in the, uh, uh, the Burmese tradition, and others had their little benches or their zafus, and then the other half were in chairs. And that's pretty much what, uh, as I understand, uh, the way Buddhism is coming to the West. And interestingly, it's true also in Asia that not everybody can sit in full lotus. Now, Master Hua insisted on it, knowing that if you, it, it's, there is a period of unpleasantness that you endure while your body is connecting, reconnecting the blood, the chi, the nerves. And what controls how quickly you reconnect? Well, uh, when my colleague, uh, Marty Verhoeven, former Bhikshu Hung Chao, and I did a pilgrimage up along the Pacific coast, uh, traveling from South Pasadena in Los Angeles, uh, down Wilshire Boulevard from number one Wilshire Boulevard through Chinatown, through uh, Lincoln Park, uh, we, we got to Santa Monica and turned north and we stayed on Highway 1 all the way north to Ukiah, 800 miles. And we, in California, excuse me one moment while I sneeze here. In California, you are not permitted to camp outdoors by the highway. Of course, you can camp outdoors in a campground or in a uh, Winnebago or something like that. But alongside the highway, there's no camping by the road. Um, in order to do the work that we were doing, essentially living outdoors, we needed a roof over our heads, but because our day, we, we did eight hours a day of bowing every day without exception, rain or shine, hot or cold. Um, we needed uh, some sort of mobile shelter. So Dr. Wesley Wu, uh, one of our staunch Dharma protectors, provided a 1957 Plymouth station wagon. And we modified that wonderful old classic car with the fins, you know, Plymouth with the fins. We modified it by taking out the back seat and uh, putting the putting the the taking out the back passenger seat and putting the 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 cargo seat flat. So what it created was this: a space inside the car where we're looking uh, towards the driver's seat here, where you can see I have one inch from my top of my head to the roof of the car, and. Marty's head is touching the roof of the car. But we meditated like this every day and every night 
for uh, two and a half years. Now, uh, it was a bit challenging, but it was our mobile Zendo, our mobile Chan Hall. This is the, the Plymouth and how we meditate. Oh, I, I'm not sharing my screen. You can't see it if I don't show you. There we go. There it is, right there. All right. So, you can see my, my head is one inch from the roof. This was Marty's regular seat right here, and he would often turn around facing the front. I sat in the back, so we're in this particular photo, we're in opposite sides of where we used to sit. This, Marty is sitting on the back cargo passenger. I'm sitting in the well of the passenger seat that we removed. So that was our, that was our mobile zendo, our, our mobile meditation hall, Chantang. All right, now, what determines how quickly you can sit in full lotus if you decide you're going to endure that waiting period for the, the internal connections to, to, to connect? for the circuits to get past the blockages. Can you, first of all, can you wait uh, through it? Now our, my senior, Dharma Master Hung Chur, is, uh, is all in as a Chan teacher. She completely, uh, one of her missions is to teach people how to meditate. And she is really Master Hua's disciple. So Dharma Master Chur uh, encourages everybody to sit in full lotus. Here in Australia, when she was the, uh, the teacher of Buddhist philosophy at Bond University, a class that I took over after she returned back to the States, um, the students were fascinated to have a, have a taste of meditation. <laughs> and they're sitting in, their, sitting in their, their plastic molded arm desk chairs. Uh, you, can, you know how, the, how classrooms have these plastic chairs, you can stack them, you can move the best, move the, the, the desks, the desk arm goes up, you know. And Dharma Master Chur would say, all right, put your back straight. I want to see you cross your legs. Do it now, full lotus, let's see it. You know? And I'm like, you're not going to do that. And the students are like, well, sure, I'll try. Ooh. And there's pandemonium in the room as everybody tries to put their legs in the full lotus, in the chairs, you know, in the, in the armchairs. So, limited success, but so interesting that any group, let's say there are 30 students in the room, there would always be four or five who would go left leg, right leg. I like this, you know. And then there would be uh, probably the majority who would be straining and pulling and saying, no way, this is impossible. And uh, when uh, shifting from Bond University here in the Gold Coast to the Buddha Hall at the Berkeley Monastery, we, every year, were visited by the Piedmont Middle School's sixth grade class. We had a, a wonderful connection with uh, Mrs. Uh, teacher, was her McGuire? Or O'Grady, she was an Irish name. Mrs. Murphy, Professor, Teacher Murphy, I think her name. She would bring four sections of the sixth grade to the Berkeley Monastery because they, they were, in the sixth grade, they were studying history of religions and they would go uh, in, uh, in, in one day, they would visit a Jewish synagogue in Oakland, they would visit a Greek Orthodox temple, a Catholic church, and then the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And every hour, we would get a new group that would come in with the parents supervising. And so in one morning, we had up to 300 sixth graders come through the monastery. And the most fun was having them come in, sit on our carpeted floor, and they were thrilled to be able to, to be invited to sit on the floor and not have to be polite and stand stiffly while they're looking at the cross or the, the sepulcher or the, the Torah. Then we said, okay, sit down everybody, boys on this side, girls on this side. Now, I'm gonna show you how to meditate. Anybody wanna meditate? Yeah, I wanna meditate. 
Okay, here's what you do. Take your leg, put your left leg here, put your right leg, and this identical phenomenon happened to what happened in Bond University is a certain number of the kids immediately were able to cross their legs and take instruction, put their head as if on a string, eyes look at the nose, nose looks at the mouth, mouth looks at the heart, sitting like this, and they settle in. And you could see that it was comfortable and it was just the most natural thing. They looked just like the Buddha sitting in full lotus. Now, <laughs> another, let's say, third, that would be mm, maybe 10% of, of the students would immediately settle in. Another 40% would be able to pull one leg up and, and kind of wiggle a little bit, but they could do one leg and they'd look at their buddies, and, you know, how are you doing? And then another half of the class would, their legs would be like this, like butterfly wings, you know. They, they couldn't get it down. And there would be athletes in the class and the athletes would just laugh and they can't do this, you know. This is, and first of all, giving them permission to, to explore this was something that they, the students really enjoyed, sixth graders. And sixth grade is a wonderful age when they're not yet too cool to do, to try something fun and silly. And yet they're still mature enough to be able to to understand what's happening. So the, right at that juncture between, between adulthood and, and childhood. So it's a perfect time to give them a flavor of what's involved. But the discovery was not everybody can sit in full lotus right away, but with exercise and with proper explanation and practice, Everybody can sit in full lotus. It's only a question of, are you willing to, to try? Are you willing to take the steps that can get you there? Stretching those tendons and ligaments, the hamstrings, and loosening the back. Even children carry tension in their back that has to relax before you can sit well. Also, key, very, very, very important. And if anybody is listening and thinks they want to try full lotus, when Master Hua was exhorting us to put up with the pain, you have to use common sense at the same time. If there is extreme pain and your body tells you this is going to result in damage to my spine or whatever, don't force it past that point. The, although uh, I mentioned that Master Hua would, you know, tell us to do it. Okay, sit now, you know, and, and be patient. Be patient with what other people can't be patient with. Ren, ren, soba, nang ren. You know, at the same time, there was, you always knew that at the end of the 60-minute period, ding, the bell would ring. <whistles> ah, meditation's over. Time to un... un pack your legs. And he would encourage us, he would say, you know, try your best and look long. If you can't do it today, add five minutes to right to the point where it hurts too much, add five minutes. Then relax and come back and try again. Tomorrow, add five minutes. You can sit five more minutes. And within six months, you're able to double the amount of time you could at the start. Shurfu did not force us past the point of pain and, and harm to your physical body. Um, we have someone in our community uh, who is determined to, to, I'm gonna sit full lotus, I really wanna do it, and sat past hurtful pain and actually took damage to his spine and then uh, because he, he was being instructed by somebody to, to don't move, don't move, you know, forcing it. And after, and had in his mind, oh, I'm a failed meditator. That's it for me. I'm never going to be able to sit in full lotus. I'm never going to be a meditator. I'm a failure. Well, came to the Berkeley Monastery and sat with a community of people who all really enjoyed, enjoyed sitting in meditation and advocated full lotus and 
gradually finding the middle way, investigating it, he found that, sure enough, he can now sit an hour in full lotus and without harm to his body. So anybody can, uh, but you have to determine that you're willing to look into this question of why, do my, why does it hurt when I meditate? Now, on three steps, one bow, sitting in that car that way, uh, my experience of full lotus and Hong Chao, Marty's experience of full lotus were different. I never had trouble crossing in full lotus. What I had trouble with was staying alert, staying awake. So what I discovered was I would get into the back of the Plymouth station wagon and it was now dark, it was 7 p.m., we'd done our evening chanting, it's now 8 o'clock, time to go to sleep, to get up early the next morning, 4 o'clock to chant and do our, sitting, our bowing. As soon as I crossed my legs, I would start to nod like this. I would tonk. Marty was sitting in front of me in the wheel well, uh, the seat well there. We had room to seat. And often I would bang into him. <laughs> when I, I would be nodding, I'd be dozing off. The, my legs didn't hurt, but I, hadn't, I didn't have control of the, the huo qi, the fire energy that is created through meditation. And I would just nod out. And I would be like a, kind of like a, a, a duck bobbing on a pond, you know. And I would bang into him. Now, Marty was uh, invited by the U.S. Air Force Academy to play halfback on their football team. Marty was a, a running back, and he had large uh, legs, you know, athletes, you could, the kind of a football body. You could bang into people. And for him, pulling that leg up into full lotus was really a challenge. And I would cross my legs and start to sit, and I would hear Marty just go, like that, and he would hold on and wait for the pain, sitting through it like this, you know. And then I would, behind him, I'd go bang and bang into him, and he would, ah! <laughs> you don't know how hard it was to, to hang on. I was hanging on to my last breath, and you bang, you know. So we went on like this, and there was it's a very small space and two monks meditating in a station wagon. So the, uh, his encounter with pain in Full Lotus was very, very different than mine. And we would write in our journals about how we would endure this and what was going on, etc. cetera. So um, the question is, what's going on with the pain in Full Lotus? Shurfu described it, Master Hua described it, as the blood vessels and the chi meridians and the nerves all working their way out, kind of gradually, gradually reconnecting. And when they do, it is very, they say, blissful, very wonderful, that feeling of unity and wholeness and energy that is all yours. Nothing added, nothing subtracted. You know, it's just your body is now reconnected in a whole new way. And it is the foundation for the dhyanas, it's the foundation for samadhi, it's the foundation for wisdom and Buddhahood. That's why all those Buddhas are pictured sitting in full lotus. That is the way it, it works. So, okay. We were in the autumn and we were up near Half Moon Bay and Northern California. And because uh, I, we had a calendar and my birthday was Halloween, it still is. My birthday is Halloween, October 31st. And so I was aware that it was now um, Halloween on the highway. And we were not, it wasn't, uh, Half Moon Bay is a long stretch of development along Highway 1. Um, isolated houses and greenhouses and restaurants and uh, 
little strip malls and things. So we were in a field and fairly isolated, but it was Halloween and people know, you know what happens on Halloween. So uh, trick-or-treating happens on Halloween. So, okay, so it gets dark much earlier in the autumn, October 31st, and we did our chanting, trying to meditate, and I'm thinking back to Halloween's past, because this is my birthday, but I had a vow of silence, so I didn't talk, and we weren't celebrating birthdays, so we just let it go. And I hear Marty pulling his leg up into full lotus and sitting there. And it's quiet for a few minutes. And then, bam! And the car goes rock, rock, rock. Both of us are like, what was that? This huge noise hit the side of the car. The car rocked. Uh-oh, we're in a abandoned field off the highway uh, at the end of a small dirt road, a farmer's dirt road. What's going on? There's, who do you call? <laughs> so nothing. So it's okay, sit again. Whew. Adrenaline calms down. Meditating again, not Marty's pulling his leg up. Bam! The car rocks like that. And we're like, oh no, oh no, what's going on? And so we roll the window down and get a flashlight and shine it around. You can't see anything. And roll the window back up, go to meditate. And I fell asleep. So the next morning, do our chanting, open the door, go out, find two pumpkins smashed against the car. It was Halloween and somebody had thrown two jack-o'-lanterns at the monk's car. Trick, no treat. We didn't have any candy for them. The only trick. And so we thought, wow. We thought it was a, some sort of a monster coming to swallow us down, maybe an alien from a spaceship. No, it was two jack-o'-lanterns hit the side of the car. So we both went for our journals and wrote our experience, what happened. And of course my thoughts were, well, I think back on all the times on my birthday on Halloween, I had tricked people and hoping for a treat. And if I didn't get a treat, I really tricked them, thinking back birthdays past, etc. And I read Marty's journal and Marty said, my goodness, he said, it's really true. Everything is made from the mind alone, he said. So I read on down and he said that it was Halloween outside Half Moon Bay in an abandoned old fallow farmer's field off the highway, struggling as always with the pain of full lotus and a loud noise hit the car and rocked the car and I didn't drop my legs from full lotus and the pain was absolutely gone. It was the most blissful meditation experience I've ever had. He said, the second pumpkin, the second noise hit the car, and at that point I had to drop my legs, but when I came back and re reconnected my full load, it was absolutely pain-free. He said, what a discovery to realize how much of the pain of sitting in full lotus is mental, fear that it's not going to ever stop, fear that meditation is a trick, it's never pleasant, it's just all some crazy monks talking about it, fear that 
I'm a failure as meditator. Something's wrong with me. When the noise came and suddenly my attention was totally diverted to whatever was going to eat us or kill us outside, I forgot all those thoughts and I was simply focused perfectly and meditation. He said, I went right through the pain gate and there was no pain. Who would have guessed it? Everything is made from the mind alone. Now, it, it would be great to say that was the last time he ever experienced pain, but no, it wasn't. But he realized how much of this experience of pain and meditation is limits imposed by the mind. And as I remember our Dharma brother, Bhikshu Hong Kong, Richard Josephson, uh, Richard uh, Hong Kong was the, the big boss meditator at Gold Mountain Monastery. He really, really sat day and night. He just, his hours of meditation were double, triple most anyone else's. He loved to meditate. And when uh, Shurfu would, uh, in the middle of a Chan session, ask Hong Kong to, to give a talk, because he, he really had much more experience meditating than any of us. He was devoted to it. And I remember I was so impressed that one time when uh, he said, people ask me, what is it like to meditate all these hours? He said, I don't know. He said, I do it simply because I like to meditate. It's my favorite thing to do. And that was all he said. And it was like, oh, yeah. Never mind, can I get through the pain gate? Is it always hurting patient when you can't be patient? some sort of nasty marine attitude towards Buddhism. No, I do it because you like it. And if you do it because you enjoy it, it's your favorite thing to do, pretty soon you'll get better at it. And all of this will make sense. So, to give uh, a, a sense of what it might be like, famous story about our grand teacher, Master Empty Cloud. He's our Master, Master Hua's uh, Dharma certifier. And Master Empty Cloud was a famous meditator. So he was living on uh, uh, Zhongnanshan in a, uh, as a hermit. And the other monks on the mountain kind of paid attention to each other. They kept track of each other because the real hermits, they wouldn't see anybody for months at a time. And the uh, uh, one hermit came to another's hut and he said, hey, have you seen Xu Lao, Master Empty Cloud, for a while? No, I haven't seen him. Maybe we'll go check on him. I haven't seen, haven't smelled the smoke from his cooking fire. I haven't seen any, haven't, usually we see his tracks going up and down, but I haven't seen him. And it was winter and it was snowing. And they went down to his hut and they saw tiger's tracks, real uh, Shan Bao, leopard tigers in the Chinese wilderness there. And the, t the tracks went past the house. They didn't see Master Empty Cloud's footprints. So they went into the, they opened the door, pushed their way in past the snowdrift. And here was Master Empty Cloud sitting in full lotus. And they said, boy, let's find out what's going on. So again, one of them took a meditation bell and went <laughs> like that. And Master Empty Cloud opened his eyes, he said, oh, oh, you've come, oh, good, good. I, I put some taro on to boil, it should be ready. I, I got, let's, let's have some food, I can sit down, I'll host you. So they went over to the stove and they lifted the lid and here was some taro with mold that had grown this long on it, green mold, the pot, had been there, the taro had been in the pot for as long as it took for it to, to grow mold. They said, how long have you been sitting? He said, oh, uh, what's the date? And they said, December 12th. He said, uh, I guess about a month. He said, he had crossed his legs and meditated and entered samadhi for a month 
thinking that he was going to sit while his taro boiled and he was going to prepare dinner. The fire went out, the wood, the wood burned out, and the taro grew mold. He'd been sitting there for a month. That's why they hadn't seen any footprints. They hadn't seen any cooking smoke or smelled it. So you think, well, what, is, what, what kind of a person is that that could do that? And the answer is a meditator who likes to meditate and who got good at it and who waited out the pain so that he indeed could just sit and when you put your, if you think the image of the full lotus, if you think about, remember incandescent light bulbs? When was the last time you held an incandescent light bulb? The kind you used to screw in before the, the compact fluorescence and before the LEDs, etc. So the fluorescent, the uh, incandescent light bulbs um, had th very thin wires. If you looked inside, you could see those thin wires connected they went around and they vibrated and when you connected them to electricity, because the wires looped up and came down, the electricity would go through and light would result. They were not efficient in terms of power in and light out. They lost a lot of it in heat, but it wasn't all light. But when the loop of wire connected, there was light light shone forth from that bulb. When we sit in full lotus, there's very much a feeling of filaments connecting. And so the energy comes through and you can sort of light up if you can be patient. But you, it doesn't start out that way. You have to retrain your body. But after sitting in full lotus, I find, and the young kids, the sixth graders in the Buddha hall, would always tell me, and the teacher, Mrs. Murphy was her name, uh, she would have the students write letters back to us. And uh, she would personally come to the monastery two weeks later with an envelope full of thank you letters from the students talking about what they, they had experienced. And there was always one or two letters from the students who said, the best part about my visit to the monastery was sitting in that funny way and I've been doing it at home and it feels so good. When I meditate like that, I feel like I'm really home. And that's my experience. When you, it doesn't matter where your body is, but when you can sit in full lotus, you feel like, ah, I'm really home. This is where I belong. This is my, I recognize myself at a new level when I'm connected. The filaments, the wires, the the blood vessels, the chi meridians, and the nerves all zoom, you know. There's all a, a, a wholeness. So that may be one of the reasons why the world honored one entered the Mani adorned palace and sat with his legs in full lotus. Oop, 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 I forgot, I forgot. Hold on. I keep forgetting to share. Let me share. There we go. Oh, there we go. The world honored one entered the Mani adorned palace, sat with his legs in full lotus posture upon the flower treasury lion's throne. Suddenly the palace expanded in vast measure, going wider and deeper. Just the way this happened in the abodes of the multitudes of devas, so too did it happen identically in deva palaces throughout worlds of the ten directions. What do you think? Maybe? I don't know. Could be. If you don't try it, you'll never know.
Pili mo ha pandaw sa iyo sa puto What do you think about that for a setting for the Dabe Jo? Work in progress, like the sutras. That's kind of the, the motif. I like it because it's percussive, and the mantra is percussive, right? Working on it, we'll give you the whole thing next time. That's a teaser. I think there's potential there. All right, uh, I will now invite the monks of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery to let us know. Let me share my screen first. Show you the Buddha in full lotus here. Invite them to share with you what's going on in, uh, in Berkeley, California. Okay, Jin Chuan Jin Wei, are you there? Am I too soon? Let's see here. Maybe their retreat isn't over yet, so I'll have to do the Berkeley Monastery. We're, uh, we do this always ad hoc. We do it off the cuff. So if they're not there, then here we go. Dharma Reflections, Three Steps, One Bow on Summer Break. We'll be taking a summer break from our daily Dharma Reflections and Three Steps, One Bow practice in the mornings. Um, there are recordings, so we will give you our best reruns, best hits. Daily ceremonies on break, uh-huh, until June 5th. Okay, that explains. Um, the Buddhas don't take a break. Here, look at the, those are Ming Dynasty Buddhas, and look what they're doing. They are sitting in full lotus. Did you notice? With the hands like that, not on your knees. Um, this Buddha has one hand palm down on his knees, one hand palm up in his lap, and the other Buddha has the same. One hand on his knees, one hand on his lap. But our center Ming Buddha, Shakyamuni, uh, has both hands in full lotus. Aren't they marvelous Buddhas? These are Ming Dynasty wooden carvings that uh, came to us through the generosity of a donor. And they have a very special chi that, uh, that they shed. That's on our main altar. So daily ceremonies are on a break until June 5th. Um, if you want to continue to do morning ceremony, three steps, one bow, Amitabha recitation and evening ceremony, use these YouTube links. And you can see the, the uh, past events recorded. Buddha Root Farm coming up. Our retreat in Reedsport, Oregon, July 8th to the 17th, should you want to take part, and I encourage you, uh, you there's an application here with lots of information, including videos of past events, past summer camps. This year is going to be different because we're going to be doing a Guanyin session. But the, uh, the information is the same. Um, COVID, for example, uh, silence, things we recommend you bring, things you don't bring, how to deal with uh, changes in your plans, etc. So there it is, Buddha Root Farm. Also information about getting there and getting back safely, etc. So very uh, wonderful 
chance to practice the Dharma outdoors in the pristine Oregon forest. Uh, monthly Dharma sharing with the local Vihara nuns on fourth Sundays. This is online. Uh, these are the, the nuns from Aloka Vihara have been uh, mainstays at the Berkeley Monastery for years now. Uh, because of COVID, they're teaching online, but if you click on the Aloka Vihara website, you can find out more about them. Um, this is their home in the foothills of the Sierras. Quite marvelous. They are Theravada bhikshunis, bhikkhunis, of the Thai forest tradition in the United States. And so inspiring to hear their stories, to receive their teachings, and to learn how uh, women monastics can thrive and propagate the life of the Dharma. There is their, their team. So, yeah, there once a month you can tune in. Here is that information again. Uh, fourth Sunday, so that will be coming up soon uh, this month in May. And uh, here's, the, here's how you find it. All righty, I think that does it for the Berkeley Monastery announcements. Here we go. Good indeed. Um, I would like to introduce us to what's coming up in the, the next the sutra. The, uh, the Buddha has arrived, taken a seat, and the uh, bodhisattvas show up. Countless bodhisattvas come, ten in particular, each of whom has a name centered around the word lean forest. Forest of merit and virtue, forest of wisdom, forest of blessings. All these bodhisattvas come and there's an opportunity for them to display their poetic ability. They all are invited to praise the Buddha in verses and they do it. Kind of, if you think about a poetry slam, uh, spoken word, poetry, hip hop sort of uh, spirit, the, uh, the bodhisattvas all praise the Buddha and sing it. And the, uh, the verses that they come up with are some of the most memorable in the entire sutra. That's why we picked this chapter 20. Some of the, the poetry that they, that they use to praise the Buddha are just superb. The one where the Buddha is likened to a master, where the, uh, the mind is likened to a master painter that can paint anything in the whole world. And it's your mind. Uh, also, the, the, the hallmark verse of the Avatamsaka Sutra, Ruo ren yu liao zhi san shi yi qie fu, ying guan fa jie xing, yi qie wei xin dao. If someone wants to really understand all Buddhas of the Ten Directions in the Three Periods of Time, contemplate the nature of the Dharma realm. Everything is made from the mind. That verse is coming up in our next chapter. So, okay, by golly. Now, I need to dig up my Medicine Buddha mantra. Um, this time, um, we, we talk about places to, to transfer merit, right? places that can use our healing energy and certainly uh, the hearts of kind-hearted people worldwide when uh, school children are gunned down senselessly and teachers as well. 21 people lost their lives needlessly, uh, violently, tragically, and everyone in the world whose heart is functioning uh, takes, takes a hit. That, it, when you, if you think about it, it's, the Chinese say, it's, you know, I can't swallow that. There's no way to make sense of that. And the pain of those who are directly related to those children and, and teachers who died, uh, you just, you know, something is torn away and it will never be replaced. You gradually, gradually return. You don't fully heal from those 
You just learn to live with it. So for that kind of healing, this mantra, Medicine Buddha's mantra, is there for that. So, and likewise, uh, a million people in America only who died because of COVID. Um, same situation, not as violent, but equally rending, equally painful. So let's do some chanting for the well-being of all of those. Next week, I'll have the, the Dabe Jo in place for, so we can do the whole thing. Uh, but meanwhile, here's our compassionate medicine Buddha, uh, Yao Shifu, who gives us this mantra. Um, it is, uh, it, it rebalances what is out of balance it harmonizes what is in chaos and disharmony, and it heals where there is harm and pain and illness. So let's recite and transfer our merit, and then we'll see you next week. here to bow to. Care to join me? Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Ami Tofu. Bye-bye, everybody.